Okay, Julian? Mark. Yes, great. Okay, are you ready? I'm going to broadcast. You can welcome people and just give it two minutes before we start. Okay. okay. I'll mute myself. Good luck, everyone. Hi everybody, I am Julian at Weavey, representing the, the Lore Alliance today for, for this event. Uh, we are waiting for, for more people to join, so just give us a couple of minutes until uh, the rest of the people can, can be participating in this, in this meeting. Thank you for coming. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining. We are waiting a couple of minutes for, for the rest of people to, to be able to participate in this webinar. Uh, thank you for, for being patient with us. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining. We are waiting for, for a couple of more people to be able to, to participate and join this webinar. Um, we will start likely in one to two minutes. Hi to all, thank you for joining. Uh, we are waiting for a couple of minutes until the rest of people can join us. Uh, so we, let's be patient, be, be patient with us and, and we'll start very soon. Hi everybody, we are going to just wait for a couple more seconds and uh, between 9.03 and 9.04 my, my Pacific time will be starting this event. Thank you for waiting. Okay, so we're gonna start, officially start the, the, the event today. Uh, my name is Julian Blanco. Um, I am based in Southern California. I am sales vice president at Weavey. We are a proud member of the Laura Alliance. 
I want to first of all wish you good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. I know we have people from, from Europe, uh, Latin America, and, and the US here. Uh, welcome to this Law Alliance webinar, Smarter Decisions and Data for Agriculture in Latin America event. Um, I will be moderating this webinar for you today. Um, we will be starting today by giving you an introduction to the LoRa Alliance and LoRa One technology. After that, I will introduce you to our panelists who will present you their company solutions and use cases. At the end of all presentations, there will be enough time for Q&A sessions during which we'll do our best to answer all the questions you have. <clears throat> you may enter any question you have during the presentation in the Q&A box on your screen. So we can gather those and analyze so, so we can answer later after all the, all the slides are gone. So in a nutshell, let me start by giving you an introduction of the Law Alliance. The Law Alliance is a non-profit organization that plays a key role in the evolution of the Internet of Things thanks to a technology called LoRa One. LoRa One is a technology in the LP1 segment that stands for Low Power Wide Area Networks. Key advantages of these technologies are the fact the devices can run on very low power and thus long battery life, sometimes up to 10 years, over multiple kilometers up to 15 years in rural areas. That means with, that with one gateway or hub, you can connect a large uh, ray, array of devices and cover a large space without having to, to set up a more complex infrastructure with multiple hubs and data points. These are longer distances <clears throat> than, some, than, than some of the other existing protocols allow. Uh, additionally, LoRaWAN technology can be deployed in, in rather complex wireless environments, and it's able to penetrate through walls or for deep indoor deployment. We have actually uh, experimented that uh, using uh, LoRaWAN technology and, and, and connecting things that are inside refrigerated chambers with uh, thick walls. So, so we, can, we can attest to that. LoRa One has low data rate transmission, extremely long battery life, and is deployable in many different structures. It is an open source protocol, which means that anyone can access it, has access to it, and can easily join the ecosystem to add value. The, the next slide, please. Since the Alliance was founded in 20, uh, 2015 by a couple of founder members, it has rapidly, rapidly grown into a structure of multiple hundreds of organizations all over the world, making the fastest growing alliance in, in, the, in the ecosystem. Alliances, alliance includes some of the biggest players, such as Machine Q, Orange, Cisco, AWS, and others. Thanks, thanks to this ecosystem, companies can collaborate closely to enhance the LoRa One protocol and offer certified and secure solutions to the market. That means that uh, this enables the, the alliance to cover multiple ranges of solutions and different verticals and, and offer comprehensive uh, infrastructure in terms of different types of sensors and, and use cases. Uh, this next slide, please. In terms of global presence, um, the LoRa Alliance uh, has become the de facto standard for LP1 globally, with networks uh, spamming 161 countries and, operate, and 143 operators around the globe. Uh, the three main goals for the Alliance are to develop, maintain, and standardize LoRa One open source protocol, use everywhere to roll out the network and connect devices, certify devices to ensure interoperability between LoRa One solutions, promote members, their products, and solutions. Next slide, please. On this slide, we can see what the LoRa One ecosystem is made of. And members of the Alliance range anywhere from chip manufacturers to system integrators and anything that comes in between. IoT connectivity with LoRa One starts with either the basic radio chips or the modules and, and enabling embedding to the LoRa One protocol stack then used in devices as wireless modems to communicate data over networks, either public or private. That means that the, the ecosystem encompasses all, basically all needs to deploy multiple types of solutions that ranges from the initial building blocks of the technology up to the, the data needs and data consumption, going in between with all the, the different uh, attributes that, that, that are needed for one particular use case. Data is collected by network servers and forwarded to application servers on the internet. This is how LoRa One enables the connectivity for the Internet of Things. Next slide, please. The LoRa, the LoRa Alliance 
operates in several verticals such as agriculture, buildings, uh, smart cities, smart industry or industry 4.0, uh, utilities and logistics. These verticals all benefit from LoRaWAN technologies in their own way uh, by taking advantage of the long battery life or the, the long range of connectivity or the ability to go through thick walls and use uh, and connect uh, using smallest a smaller footprint of infrastructure or the ability to create a private network in today's webinars we're going to address smart agriculture next slide please here are a couple of different key differentiators that of our benefits uh, of lora one you can either use a public or private network to gather your data and manage automation that means that uh, you, you, can, you can build your own network just adding one access point or gateway uh, connected with LoRa technology, or you can join a larger network uh, that is provided by some other, the other party. Uh, public rollouts are like classic cellular network, whereas a private network can be a, an instant that runs on as well as Wi-Fi and can be either completely self-managed or support from uh, an ecosystem partner like a system integrator. LoRa One is bi-directional standard, which means that it's, it's, it's easier to run firmware updates over the air. That means that you can, if you are connected to the internet uh, with the gateway, you can manage not only the information that you're receiving, but also the devices that are in that network. It, is, it has very secure encryption with two layers. One is for the actual link, and the second is for the payload. The payload is the information that's been sent with a key information that, that the sensors are, are transmitting to the network. So much like, uh, like uh, cellular networks, the network provider cannot see the data that is passing through. Only the end user will be able to see that data. It is very energy efficient, as mentioned before. Battery life can go anywhere from five up to 10 years, avoiding having to change batteries by accessing often remote or complex areas. This allows, in many cases, us to, to place uh, sensors and devices in, in, in very difficult to access spaces that are very hard to, to connect otherwise. Sensors are low cost, and the network has an easy setup process. Next slide, please. So now allow me to introduce the, the, the speakers, the Lore Alliance speakers for today uh, that we will be presenting their, their use cases and solutions. Next slide, please. So the first one is me. Hi, <laughs> again. Uh, then we have uh, Barney Barnowski uh, from TechTelic. Tectelic is a <clears throat> provider of best-in-class carrier-grade LoRaWAN hardware and software for wireless networks based in Canada. We also have Patrick. Um, I'm very sorry I'm butchering all the, all the last names here. Uh, we have Patrick Bredhauter. Brett Hauser. And Patrick, then you can, you can just tell us what your last name sounds, really sounds like. Um, he is uh, at Compsesa. And they are large system integrators that, that focused on irrigation and, and, and other solutions in Latin America, based in, Latin, based in Ecuador. We have Jose Fernandez, uh, CEO at Aeon Chips. Aeon Chips, uh, it's um, IoT device manufacturer based in Barcelona, Spain, that is also serving our region in Latin America. Next slide, please. We have uh, our friend Kirk, Kirk Apperford from Semtech. Semtech is a sem semiconductor chip manufacturing that providing uh, LoRa technology, the, the DNA for IoT. And finally, we have Scott Cubes. Uh, Scott Cubes uh, is at Orbiwise, a uh, Swiss-based supplier for industrial leading, industry leading LoRa One network server, Orbi One. Next slide, please. So now I'm gonna leave the floor for, for Kirk, to, Kirk to present Semtech solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. The um, good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for taking uh, time out of your schedules to participate in this uh, in this webinar. Um, I want to briefly sort of start out with um, our new, Semtech's newest product, which is the LR1110 chipset. And really, what that is, it's it's a new chipset that really concentrates on location. Um, the, um, as anybody knows with GPS or GNSS, 
LP WAN and GNSS do really not don't fit hand in hand simply because uh, GPS has a high power consumption and LP WAN is low power consumption. Uh, also, you have to you have the indoor and outdoor um, issues. So Semtech sought out to really solve number one how they how we can get location uh, both in an indoor and an outdoor environment with a um, with a low power uh, unit. So you know as you can see there, trying to solve indoor and outdoor location you know, arrival, departure of, uh, you know, traceability of, of articles that are out there. You can do geofencing, uh, a lot of asset recovery. Um, there's a lot of high dollar either products or equipment that's out in the field that uh, you definitely don't want to lose. And again, you can, um, with the cloud services, you can set up custom zones, alarms uh, for theft pre pre prevention. Uh, next slide, please. So where, where really are the challenges that we're trying to tackle? So the, you know, the existing solutions, they really require a lot of multiple vendors. So, you know, when you're talking about, you know, GPS or GNSS, uh, you have that for your outdoor location, you have, you know, Wi-Fi, potentially Bluetooth, um, there's also RFID is, is used for indoor tracking. So it really in, increases the uh, bill of materials cost, you know, your whole design, uh, the complexity of everything that comes to that. Also a lot really where you get to it is the existing solutions are, they're power hungry. It's just, that's just the way GPS has always operated to date. Obviously over the past 20 years, power consumption you know, battery design has gotten better, power consumption has gotten less, uh, but not conducive to work with LP WAN, um, LP WAN technology. So, you know, uh, with the high cost of bill of materials, it's always been prohibitive to have a solution that transfers from indoor to outdoor to indoor again. Uh, that's, you've always had to deploy two different solutions for those, uh, for those tracking. Next slide, please. So this will give you just sort of a high level overview. So um, I don't want to get really too technical with this, but um, really where, where we've made the difference uh, with the LR1110 is that we're doing the um, location calculations in the cloud. It's not being done on the, um, uh, on the chipset level or on the, uh, the local, like for example, field computers. So, you know, for those of you that, you know, are, are familiar, familiar with large acre cereal farming, um, where you're using field computers and uh, guidance uh, out in the fields, uh, a lot of you could be using what we call RTK technology, where you're receiving uh, satellite GNSS um, signals, and then you're, re you're also receiving uh, terrestrial GNSS correction signals. Uh, so that's, you know, you need a powerful local computer in order to be computating your position in real time all the time. So that's really where the power consumption comes from. Um, that's what uh, we've uh, endeavored to solve there by um, moving really all the calculations to the cloud. Next slide, please. So in this, you can see where we've really positioned the LR1110. Um, really on the uh, left-hand vertical curve, you have your accuracy, and then along the bottom, you have your power consumption. So, you know, we're not going to pretend that we have a high accuracy two centimeter solution. That's not the case. Um, you know, we're talking solution that gets consistent solution that gets into, into meters. Uh, indoors with the, um, uh, with the more gateways that you actually increase in an indoor setting, you can increase your, your accuracy. But we're also where we do play well is in the uh, power consumption. So GPS is really synonymous with 
higher accuracy, but also higher power consumption. So we're a little bit lower on the accuracy side, but obviously extremely low on the power consumption side. Next slide, please. So this will give you sort of an overall solution um, view of the, uh, of the architecture. The, uh, the servers, you know, the LoRaWAN server, application server, um, don't need to go. You can, um, you can access both the um, uh, LoRa Alliance and Semtech website if you really want to get into uh, more technical data. But really the key that we're pointing out here is that the, um, you know, the data that's being transmitted is going to the cloud and the cloud uh, through the um, LoRaWAN servers and application servers is what's calculating your location. Next slide, please. So also, you know, with that technology, we're not, we also are incorporating, we're incorporating Wi-Fi, um, incorporating Bluetooth in order to get location um, a little bit more precise. Uh, so people that are familiar with Wi-Fi, you, you know, they have MAC addresses, there's Wi-Fi lookup services on the internet uh, to look up those MAC addresses for, uh, for location, uh, their packets, information, uh, and everything else. Also, you know, we can combine that with triangulation of RSSI signals uh, when you now have more than three different gateways that um, those particular sensors are sending signals out to. So those, you know, we're combining multiple technologies in order to be able to provide a low power uh, accurate solution. Next slide, please. So here's a little bit of um, what the agribusiness ecosystem can look like for this uh, for these solutions. Um, you know, you have worker tracking, uh, for example, in the um, palm oil business. Uh, you really need to know that your workers are spending the correct amount of time looking at the um, uh, the palm during the growing season. Uh, to be able to determine correctly that, um, you know, when it comes time for harvesting. So you can use that for worker location. Obviously, your in-field sensors, uh, you know, you have moisture sensor, temperature sensors, weather sensors. There's a whole variety of in-field sensors. Uh, also being able to track your agricultural equipment. One of the key things is that, you know, previously you would have sensors uh, without location. But today it's really almost becoming a de facto requirement that every sensor uh, is combined with a location. Uh, everybody wants to see where that sensor is and the data coming off of that. Uh, seed and chemical logistics, you know, being the seed companies, being able to, you have reusable grain bins and chemical bins uh, to be able to track those bins but also to be able to track humidity, temperature on how that product is actually being stored. Obviously you have harvesting bins for product out in the field for logistics, being able to track where those bins are uh, in order to keep efficient uh, harvesting produce coming through. Livestock tracking, you know, whether you're talking cattle, sheep, um, out in the field, uh, inside feedlots, uh, there's obviously a lot of solutions out in the marketplace for that. Again, you have packaging and manufacturing facilities. So you're going to have, you know, whether it's pineapple production, sugarcane production, um, you have the whole gamut of services that these uh, companies provide. So they're growing product out in the field and it's going right through to the manufacturing facilities. Global cold chain logistics. That's a solution that um, uh, Semtech has tackled uh, with new 2.4 technology to be able to track uh, reefers. So reefers that you know, are going to be shipped from, for example, Central America to North America with uh, fresh produce or produce from, you know, even wine from South America to Europe over to Asia. You'll be able to track the health of those containers uh, in real time. 
Again, silo bag sensors. Everybody's used to seeing huge vertical silos over the years. A lot of that has changed now to horizontal silo bags that are on the ground. Being able to check the temperature and humidity of those bags is essential. And next slide, please. I did want to spend a little bit of time on this um, vertical market structure. Because a lot of us here, when we refer to smart ag or agriculture or sensors, our first thought process is a sensor at the grower level, the grower level, which you can see at the bottom. Now that's, uh, that's perfect. Obviously, you know, we need to see how we can increase production by reducing costs, reducing input costs, uh, electricity, being able to save water. But for example, every one of these verticals that you see has an interest in the data. So, you know, we're talking about a moisture sensor or we're talking about a tracking sensor with uh, temperature and humidity or sensors that are in silos. Ultimately, the common denominator of all of those is the data. The data is used differently by each by each level and sometimes you know you need to look at it from both points of view we have a lot of solution providers providing solutions that could be targeting the grower but at the same time there may be more value to it at a banking insurance level or an ag retailer level and then at the same time you'll have interest at the grower level um, for a specific solution and they could be using it, for example, let's take um, um, uh, viticulture, for example, the production of grapes. So there are solutions out in the marketplace where you know, you're looking at uh, optimizing uh, irrigation in the, uh, in the vineyards. Uh, so there is obviously a direct ROI for that. But at the same time, those bottles, these, um, the grapes produced into wine and they're bottled. Well, they're shipped. So, you know, imagine a container that is um, filled with cases of wine bottles that the refrigeration unit went down and it's sitting at a port in, for example, the country I reside in, in Costa Rica, it's being imported. It's sitting at port for two days under the sun and the in internal temperature got to 50 degrees Celsius. So you're going to get spoilage on that. Thank you. Thanks. You. Thanks a lot. If you have any any questions for Kirk, we will have roughly half an hour after all the presentations are done. Uh, thanks a lot, Kirk, for for your very interesting presentation on, on Semtech. Uh, we'll move on now with uh, Barney Bar Barnowski from Tectelic. Barney, please. Uh, thank you very much, Julian and Kirk. Thank you very much uh, for setting up setting me up with that last chart. Um, first of all, thank you all for joining the webinar. I'm happy for this opportunity to share with you some of the things that Tectelic is doing in uh, smart agriculture. Uh, and I want to set the stage first with respect to how we view IoT and its benefits to agriculture. And if you recall Kirk's last chart, I'm going to talk about kind of the grower level, those sort of initial uh, levels where, you know, the food is produced or where the, uh, uh, the animal uh, husbandry is, is happening. Um, we're, I'm based here in snowy Calgary, Alberta, and uh, for the for the most part, we're surrounded by oil and gas, and we're also surrounded by a lot of growers, a lot of farms. And whenever when we first introduced some of our devices, which I will introduce you here in a moment, uh, a lot of the farmers that we talked to objected with the term smart agriculture because their pushback was, well, we're already smart, right? And it's true. In order to be successful in any type of agriculture, you have to be smart. Right. So can we make it at least a bit easier? Right. So traditional farming, uh, for the most part, relies on management of entire fields and making decisions related to planting, harvesting, irrigating, timing and the amount of pesticides and chemicals that you use. And it's all largely based on historical data. When we flip the script around and we introduce networks like LoRa, 
and devices that are based like on the LR1110, awesome device, by the way. However, our devices, which I'll show you here in a moment, are based on the 1262, so the previous generation. Uh, but when we introduce precision farming tools like that, enabled by LoRa, in contrast, we shift the delivery of data from the historical to the real-time delivery of information, right? So with the real-time data and information that combines sensor data, GPS information, mapping tools, all of this allows us to customize the care for the crops. And this is all done without increasing any labor. And at the same time, we reduce resources like water usage, chemicals, fertilizer, and most importantly, the farmer's time and the amount of time they have to dedicate to the care of those plants. So this technology, in summary, for my introduction, uh, this precision farming or the movement from historical data to real-time data uh, allows us to improve the time management resource optimization like water. We'll talk lots about water here in a minute, chemical usage, and it allows us to improve yields. Now, how do we implement this, right? So I have a much more simplified picture here rendered uh, relative to what Julian showed us about the LoRa architecture. Uh, Tectelic builds devices uh, end devices, which we'll talk about here in a moment, to address many different use cases. Uh, but those devices and the data produced by those devices have to be collected by gateways. And Tectelic builds probably some of the best gateways in the world. Uh, we have a full portfolio, which can be deployed very successfully in a lot of different growing areas. Our gateways can be powered through solar uh, type uh, powering, backhauled over cellular. They're carrier grade, which means they can be safely deployed on all kinds of environmental conditions. Once the data is collected from the sensors through the gateways, that gets passed onto the network server layer. S Scott Cubis from OrbiWise will talk lots more about network servers, so I'm not gonna get into that. And ultimately that data is handed off to that application layer. Whether that application lives on your iPhone or an AWS, that's really up to the implementation. What I'm going to concentrate on is the very left-hand side of this picture, which is how do we take the, you know, how do we go above the chip level? How do we get above the silicon level? And we actually start collecting some interesting data. Next chart, please. So first of all, I want to sort of call out some of the use cases that we've been involved in over the years. And I kind of started with precision agriculture. That's kind of an all-encompassing term. But really what that means is, you know, ability to know when to plant, how much to plant, water management, as part of that water management, you know, the, the storage of the actual grains, asset tracking, livestock management, as well as smart greenhouses. And we have devices and applications for most of these uh, areas. Let's start with the precision agriculture, uh, agriculture one. So let's jump to the next chart. Next chart, please. Thank you. So one of the first areas and one of the simplest areas that, but it has tremendous payoff in terms of resource uh, optimization is the knowledge and the ability to, and, and the ability to determine how much water needs to be used, especially in areas where, you know, some of the more arid growing areas like say California, or, you know, here in Canada, we have British Columbia where we have lots of viticulture and we grow lots of grapes uh, for, for wine production. Uh, to help with this, Tectelic developed an agricultural, agricultural sensor, which is essentially a soil moisture uh, monitoring device, right? We have two variants of this device, but the point is, is that you drive this into the soil and based on the gravimetric volume content of the, uh, soil mo uh, moisture, the moisture in the soil or on the tension uh, that's applied to the probes, as in the case of our elevated mount, we're able to monitor the temperature of the soil, the water content of the soil, and we can also monitor the light conditions associated with that particular area of the field. This information can be relayed to the application and it allows us now to make a smart decision about how much water went to water and basically be able to optimize the deployment of resources, uh, whether that's a precision agricultural example, whether that's a tree farm, or even a golf course. Now, that obviously covers us for the water management piece. Uh, we've also encountered a use case that deals with storage of grain. So let's go to the next chart. Um, so once we have successfully grown our crops, successfully grown whatever it is we're growing, one of the areas 
uh, one of the corner cases, if you will, of agriculture is the storage, right? And when it comes to storage, quite often, because we're dealing with biomass, uh, there is the possibility of decomposition. And by virtue of decomposition, there's a possibility of actual fires. So we have developed a device that allows us to monitor the temperature of what we call mulch piles, but really it's the ability to monitor any sort of pile of biodegradable material, whether it's grain, banana leaves, uh, you know, wood chippings. Uh, as these things accumulate over time and potentially get moist, there's a possibility that they basically get so hot that they in fact combust. Here in Alberta, we store grain in you know, big metal storage bins. And every year, one or two of these grain bins catches on fire, simply by virtue of the fact that there's been some decomposition occurring in the grain and the temperature gets so hot that the grain bin catches on fire, typically resulting in a loss of 80 to $100,000 worth of grain. Right, so while the use case here is remarkably simple because all we're monitoring for is temperature, temperature of the grain, um, it becomes a very powerful and very cost-effective solution in order to deploy because you know the cost-benefit just kind of writes itself. Okay, so that's kind of the growing, the, the 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 monitoring. Let's talk about asset tracking. So this is something, the area that Kirk kind of expanded on. So let's talk about asset tracking and see what we're doing there. Can I see the next chart, please? Okay. So with respect to tracking, obviously, again, from a time management and from a resource management perspective, knowing where things are within the uh, farm, within the, uh, within the ranch, is obviously very important, whether or not you're trying to track uh, large industrial assets like trailers, combines, you name it, people, or even the animals themselves. So in, for that purpose, Tectelic has developed a number of different asset trackers where we do in fact combine GPS, LoRa, as well as Bluetooth into a single compact form factor. And by optimizing the software on these devices, we can get potentially up to eight to 10 years of battery life, especially on the larger devices, because we need to track sometimes assets that don't have a readily available source of power. It's easy enough to track a John Deere tractor because you have the battery, you have the thing operating. So it's easy enough for us to get GPS coordinates out of that. How do you get GPS coordinates out of a trailer? How do you get GPS coordinates out of a piece of equipment that may not necessarily have a readily available source of power? Again, LoRa is an extremely powerful solution for that because by combining it with an accelerometer, by combining it with GPS, we can get eight to 10 years of battery life. We also have smaller units which can be attached to staff, whether or not those people are the farm workers, you'll know where your farm workers are, uh, as well as very small and uh, cost-reduced devices that can be applied to livestock. Um, however, Kirk also alluded to the idea of triangulation, and that is exactly another solution that we have introduced in the context of smart agriculture. So if I can see the next chart. So I started with the idea of deploying soil moisture sensors, right? Um, and the soil moisture sensors, typically when, we, when you see the next use case, we can deploy potentially up to hundreds of them in the field. Uh, the question we always get asked is, that's all well and good. I've deployed these for the growing season, but now the growing season is over and I need to pull them out. How do I know where they are, all right? Uh, and LoRa has a very nice capability, which is a time delay of arrival geolocation, which allows us to, through the power of triangulation, narrow in to the area of where those LoRa devices are down to 20 meters worth of accuracy. And in line of sight areas, which is typically an agricultural type deployment, you know, growing field, you can get down to as low as 10 meters, which means that once you've deployed these LoRa enabled assets, even though they themselves don't have GPS, you can still find them at the end of the growing season. You can pull them out of the field in order to be able to plow the field or do whatever it is you need to do in order to prepare it for the next growing season. And this, I would say, by itself is an extremely powerful capability. If you combine it with other things like the LR1110, you're, you're going to have even more capabilities like this. And LoRa obviously presents itself as an even better solution for uh, agriculture. So just wanted to wrap up with one use case. We have lots of use cases, but on the next chart, I uh, just wanted to give you a quick example of a tree farm 
again, we have lots of local examples here because obviously there's lots of growing done in and around Alberta. The province next to ours, uh, there is a hops and cider apple farm where again, their primary concern was the amount of water they were using and where they were using that water, uh, water in order to be able to use it as efficiently as possible. So they deployed our sensors, they deployed our gateways. We gave them a very simple application and uh, they had a very successful growing season. And uh, you know, there's lots of example like this. So if you would like to learn a little bit more, just shoot me a question in the, uh, in the Q and A. And I see Julian's already showed up on camera. So I guess I'm out of my 10 minutes. Uh, so if you have any questions, uh, by all means, uh, shoot, shoot us a note and uh, thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Barney, for, for your presentation. Very insightful on, on Tectelic products. Uh, so let's go now to Scott Cubes at Orgwise. Uh, thank you, Julian. And uh, actually, that, that was a really great segue from Barney and uh, Simtech. So uh, anyway, hello, everybody. I'm Scott Cubis. I'm head of business development and sales in the Americas, other places for Orbywise SA. Uh, we're a Swiss-based company uh, with our core product is the LoRaWAN network server. So um, you've heard quite a bit on solutions. Uh, which is fantastic. I know everybody wants to hear about that. And we have talked about some of the solutions that, that with our partners uh, we're doing in Smart Ag. I guess we had a, a webinar six months ago, but wanted to take a slightly different tack with this to talk a little bit more about what you're going to be looking at from a network perspective uh, to use LoRaWAN. And um, that's not to make it sound like it's a dawning uh, thing. I think you'll find the technology is very easy to work with. You've got fantastic companies within the Alliance. Uh, you've met some, you're gonna meet some more here in a minute. Um, so, but just a quick about us, like I say, we're, we, we supply the, uh, the core network server. We've got a family of products in that and I'll kind of go into that a little bit and, and what the LoRaWAN network server does. We're based out of Switzerland, but we do have other offices uh, globally. Um, some of our partners we work with, uh, you'd seen Tata and uh, Chevron, I know mentioned before, but um, others within the Americas you can see here and specifically ones that work with uh, agriculture. Um, so our friends at Yep uh, and Caravan, which are sister companies uh, located in Buenos Aires. Uh, yep is doing more straight uh, crop type stuff and Caravan is uh, working with uh, cattle uh, tracking and health monitoring and so forth. And then in Brazil, we have some great partners with Agro Things and now Opteam who is uh, getting into agriculture in Brazil. Uh, you can see that Yep and Caravan are beyond, have moved beyond just Argentina and other uh, countries as well. And then our friends at 11X up in Canada are starting to, to look at some, some agriculture stuff as well. And beyond that, we've got another you know, half a dozen partners that uh, can't really go into details on, but uh, are working in uh, various uh, areas of agriculture. Uh, this is more on the end production. So I really liked uh, Kirk's slide on the vertical market, which was good. But if you have more details, you see my contact details in our website. Some of the solutions, I mean, uh, for instance, like this is uh, Agro Things. This is their farm vehicle performance managing device, for instance, that goes into tractors and other vehicles on the farm. Um, the asset tracking, which the guys have talked about quite a bit already. Um, farm facility monitoring, uh, mentioned grain silo earlier, water regulation and irrigation management the soil moisture, uh, we mentioned the cattle uh, elements and then weather monitoring. So these are all very good uh, use cases that we're directly dealing with now. So if you could go to the next slide, please. Okay, so basically with the network, you're looking at four main elements and it's not to say there aren't other things you're going to need to consider as you go into uh, uh, starting up your uh, LoRaWAN network. Of course, depending on you know how much you do it yourself and how much you involve say uh, some of our friends here that you know we're all on this call and uh, of course we can support your your efforts. 
But you have your devices, obviously, which are the important part. That's what's delivering the information that you need to take action with on your farms or other industries. Uh, these in turn, of course, are talking to your gateways. So these are folks such as Barney and, and Tectelic. And of course, there's multiple vendors in gateways and devices. Uh, the server, uh, for instance, our Orbiwan uh, LNS, but there are other options there as well. And then finally, you're connecting into your backend applications and application servers. So this is where you're getting to to crunch your data and make something useful out of it. And of course, all of this is, in this case, what I'm talking about here, you're sitting on the cloud somewhere. Now this can be a public or private cloud, which has implications. So you can go to an AWS, for instance, uh, for a public solution, or if you have your own servers, uh, you can set up on those as well. But of course, this is highly reliant on having a connection to the internet or to the cloud. Um, and in this case, this is a full server. It's capable of, uh, or this network, and with our server and other equivalent LNSs, can support you know tens, hundreds, thousands of gateways, uh, you know tens, hundreds, thousands, millions of devices on a properly scaled network. And this gives you the ability to work with multiple devices, multiple gateways, and uh, different applications and application servers. So you can see the general path here. So it's always important to make sure you select good partners that can support you uh, in, in building out your network. Now, in the case of, of agriculture, if you think about Kirk's very nice vertical market piece, if you're working with the upper elements of the network, so you're, you're processing food, your storage, Generally speaking, you're going to be able to use a network with like this without an issue. Uh, you should generally have access to the cloud in some manner. Um, so you run into less issues. So more of your issues there or around your IT challenges you may have. Uh, firewalls internal to, to companies, which believe me, we've run into many times. Uh, but, you know, working with companies, it's very easy to work through this. Um, security, of course, becomes a big element, and this was touched on earlier uh, as well. Uh, LoRaWAN is a very secure technology, uh, um, so really, honestly, you shouldn't have to worry about that. And once again, with the partners that are available within the LoRa Alliance, you know, we can address any kind of security concerns that you may have that come up. Um, now, of course, part of sizing a network like this, you have to have the ability to be realistic about where you add are initially in setting up your network, and then where you're going in the future in terms of the size of your cloud setup, where you should set up and how these things should be connected. And thinking about your devices and gateways, um, you've talk, heard a bit about the devices, um, your, your applications, you can connect to many or even a single application server or multiple, like I said. Um, your devices and gateways, you're gonna wanna think about being uh, ruggedized. You know, this is an IP grade device and gateway. You have to consider your power consumption. This is, for example, a battery that you would use in many devices. So keep that in mind, you know, and we can do this, um, uh, we can go into this in some more details later. If you can go to the last slide then. So I'm going to touch on this real quick. So a good example with our friends at AgroThinks as an example. Uh, a new part of our family of LoRaWAN server products is what we call OrbiWAN Edge. This is a lighter weight version of our server, but with most of the capabilities. And it's designed to work in very remote locations where you basically can have a standalone network. So the connection back to the cloud is optional. So, I mean, you know, if you want to get a satellite connection, you know, there's multiple suppliers that, that work with LoRaWAN there. If you can manage a, an Ethernet connection or if you can find some kind of wireless backhaul, but it's intended to stand alone. So, the server would be combined with application or server or applications on a small, uh, portable, lightweight uh, server or computer 
on the farm and it can handle multiple gateways up to tens of gateways or down to single gateways. And then with the devices, it's intended for tens, hundreds, low thousands of devices. So it, it's really intended to be a totally intact network. Um, so this is something kind of new. Uh, it sits in between an on gateway server, which is supplied by any number of uh, gateway suppliers, but is intended for an even smaller setup. So maybe single gateway and, and few devices. So this sits in between, but this addresses that issue you have in the case of like agro things being up in a very remote area of Brazil where they have no internet connection or it's intermittent or broken uh, that they can continue the smooth LoRaWAN operations with all the capabilities and features and functions that you, you have heard about and we'll hear about some more. So um, something to keep in mind there. Uh, I was trying to think of any other quick points on this as we start to wrap up my segment. Um, uh, the small app servers are actually very affordable. Uh, there's a number of these that can be available for $500 or so, I know. Uh, there's one that we recommend. And like I say, this is intended for small to medium-sized networks and in remote locations. So as smart agriculture is one application, but we also mentioned this in a recent uh, oil and gas presentation as well as a good example. So... With uh, that being said, uh, if you have any questions on this, we can field that in a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Scott, for your time and for your presentation. Uh, again, any questions you have, there is, a, there is a box in the bottom right corner of the, of the Zoom application where you can ask the questions, and we will make sure to answer during the, the presentations or after the presentations. Okay. Well, it looks like now it's my turn. Hi, everybody again. Uh, I am Julian Blanco. I'm based in, in Southern California. Uh, I represent, uh, I am a VP at, at Weavy Corporation. Uh, we are a company based in, in Silicon Valley, uh, focused for the last seven years on IoT solutions. We have solutions that, that range from agriculture to smart industry, uh, retail, etc. In this case, we're going to focus on one piece of one solution uh, that is aimed at uh, the peak production. Uh, Weavy, in a nutshell, is a no-coding IoT platform that enables uh, companies to build end-to-end uh, -end solutions from, the, from connecting multiple sources of data, like uh, LoRa enabled sensors, uh, gateways, uh, PLCs, uh, ERPs, etc., uh, building the solutions in, in, in our Weavy cloud and deploying applications that not only show you information, but also enable you to, to automate processes by using LoRa's bi-directional capabilities. Uh, next slide, please. So in this case, we're, again, we're going to focus on one piece of one solution. And again, we have many other solutions that range from, from poultry to, to industry 4.0. Uh, in this case, we chose to, to focus on the, on, the, on the main challenges of pre-weaning process for pigs uh, in the barns. And again, this is one application. We have many other uh, cases that we can, we can discuss and, and expand on. Um, go focusing on that particular uh, solution or, or issue, uh, we see that the mortality rate uh, for for in the pre-weaning part of the the pig production process is between ten and twenty percent, and the major cause of that uh, of those deaths is uh, crushing. That is when the when the mother would sit down or lay down on top of one of the piglets and, and asphyxiate it to death. Uh, that accounts for roughly 70% of, of those deaths. Uh, the current process to control what's happening in these in this, uh, barns spaces is by having humans uh, running around and making sure that everything is going fine. And if they hear a piglet uh, squeaking, then go fix that, that situation. That, of course, uh, leads to many human errors and, and nobody can be uh, looking at, at the pigs 24 by seven, right? It's a very time consuming uh, process that, that again, it, it gives space for, for, some, for some multiple issues. 
The second is from a, from a perspective of uh, human, uh, animal welfare. Uh, there are many uh, conditions in the barn that, that generate stress on the animals that also impacts uh, the well-being of, of the animals and the ability to gain weight and other, and other factors, like the air quality conditions, uh, including ammonia and methane, um, the temperature and humidity, and the automated systems that are supposed to be maintaining that stable for the pigs. And finally, these types of challenges uh, have a very large impact in, in the soil production. So roughly in a, in a 1,000 1, soil uh, or mother production, uh, we are talking about roughly $60,000 or more that are lost due to, to these crashing events and other things that are preventable by using the technology. Next slide, please. So uh, what is our approach to these problems and other problems is basically uh, we, we go in and we take data when the, where data is available. In some cases, uh, the barns are enabled with uh, PLCs uh, for some data points. So we can, as we, we can integrate with that, extract that data and manage that in the cloud. Uh, and then we add a layer on top with uh, LoRa, LoRa sensors and actuators that will enable us to have the full visibility of what's going on and organize the data and, 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 and show uh, our customers the, the, all the historic information so they can make uh, in, informed decisions. In this case, focusing on the, on the crashing events, what we offer is a smart camera. The camera is placed on top of the, of the place where the, the P-winning uh, is, is happening and basically it tracks objects, right? It can track uh, the movement of the piglets and the, move, the, the limited, but the movements on, of the mother as well and can alert us if uh, one of the piglets is inside the space that the mother is and, is, and there's a crashing event. That alert, that, that, that situation can trigger uh, an alert that is a sound alert, uh, a light alert on, on, on site, but it can also trigger an, an SMS alert and trigger a, an, an email in case uh, it's required. So you don't need to necessarily rely on a person being a 24 by seven looking at every single cache but having this type of uh, intelligence built in, you can automate part of that process and send the person to the right place and thus uh, reducing the, the number of, of, of crashing events. The technology doesn't stop just with crashing. Uh, as we are tracking these, uh, these piglets or these objects in the space, we can start uh, looking at the behavior and, and, and tracking, for example, if a piglet is not moving as, as it should, uh, comparing it to other piglets and, and figuring out if there is an issue with, uh, with the temperature, uh, with a disease or some other factors. All that you can see on the, on the graphic in, in the right uh, that those uh, lines of different colors represents the movements of piglets in the space. So again, you can, uh, you can use that information to start uh, inferring what is happening and, and making decisions to, to prevent issues or to solve issues that are happening at that particular moment. So the LoRa One technology enables us to uh, add one, one gateway that could be from, from our friends at, at TechTelic uh, and be able to cover a whole uh, barn or a whole site uh, and connect every single sensor and data point to that gateway and, and route that back to the, to the internet, not only for us to be able to see what's going on, but also to take action uh, with uh, controlling, for example, bulbs that could be from our friends at, at Aeon Chip that are gonna present later or, or, or capture all the data coming from the, from the sensors. So this will give you a 360 uh, understanding of the, the environment the animals are in. And again, we are focusing here on the crashing, but it can also uh, include uh, information like uh, temperature and humidity, uh, ammonia and methane gases uh, con concentration. Uh, with that, we can uh, make choices to, to open a window, to turn on a fan, and to activate other devices, uh, alerts, and, and show the information. Uh, next slide, please. So here is what uh, the, 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 the pig farmer will, will be seen or can see. Uh, if you look at in the, in the middle of the screen, you have uh, two charts that I'm gonna discuss briefly. One is the pre-winning mortality. 
uh, we can uh, get that information uh, initially by integrating the data that is coming from the from the, the, the ERP or the system that is used to manage that particular farm. Uh, again, we can connect to the PR ERP, we can connect to the to the PLC, or uh, in some cases we can even uh, get that information automatically uh, coming from the camera, right? The camera is detecting that there are, let's say, 10 pigs, and, and two days later the camera is detecting only eight pigs, so we assume that two pigs are, are lost in the process, right? So this can give you a weekly accurate view of, of what's going on. Uh, the second one, uh, the feedstock, uh, I'm going to dive slightly uh, deeper into that space uh, in the next slide. But we can, uh, using uh, level sensors and flow sensors, uh, start giving the farmer information to optimize the, the feeding process. And, and being, the, being, being the feeding as such an expensive part of the process, uh, when we improve uh, a couple of points in, in the way uh, that process is managed, that represents thousands of dollars of, of savings or improvements at the end of the year. Next slide, please. So here's an, another view. Uh, in this case, uh, we are looking at, at, at environment, equipment, equipment and alerts. I'm gonna just focus on, on the equipment piece. Uh, we've seen in some cases that uh, a critical failure may happen in the equipment. It's rare, but but it does happen, right? Let's say the uh, uh, a fan gets jammed and there's no new air coming for the pigs, or there's an issue with the temperature or some other factor. That is a rare occurrence, but when it happens, it can lead to a very widespread mortality and, and massive losses, right? So in this case, we can, uh, on one hand, control those devices, but we can also uh, have uh, sensors that are telling us if that device is working, right? For example, we can add um, an energy monitor sensor uh, to the fan to make sure that the fan is actually consuming energy. So if the, if the fan is supposed to be working, but it's not using energy, we can trigger a, a, an automatic alert and let the farmer know that there's something wrong with that fan, right? The same with, with, a, with a window that should be open or some other piece of the automated system that is again connected to, to uh, the overall environmental information that we are receiving. Uh, next slide, please. So here's another view uh, that we provide. In this case, what we are seeing is uh, if you look at the, the two red uh, squares there, those are crashing events that require attention. Then you have uh, spaces that are empty. And then you also have uh, information about the um, about uh, milking events. Again, we can track not only crashing, but other types of events that happen with, with the piglets in the pre-winning uh, in the pre-winning process. Below you have a mortality and a dash data. Again, these dashboards are completely uh, you can automate, uh, sorry, you can um, you can customize them to, to feed your exact needs and connect the data that is available. Let's then slide this. So here is a quick view of, uh, of, a, of a pig farm site. Uh, again, with one uh, LoRa gateway, you are able to connect all this space and get the data coming from all the sensors in, in every single room uh, to track every single position if that were the case. And you have there some, some examples of, of uh, the types of sensors from uh, temperature, humidity, um, level sensor for water, flow sensor, flow, flow meter, etc. Next slide, please. So to, to wrap it up, uh, for this particular uh, example of the on, on, on pre-weaning and crash prevention, uh, we we are seeing a reduction of roughly 17% in, in mortality due to crashing, right? By by implementing this technology, that that represents several thousands of dollars that are uh, saved every year by by increasing the uh, de decreasing the mortality of the animals. Second, we are seeing uh, increases of more than 2% in the optimization of, of the feeding process by uh, using the flow meters and, and, and level sensors and being able to optimize when and how the animals are fed. That again, the, the farmer will use that information to, to make informed decisions in order to increase overall productivity. Uh, we can also uh, in, diminish or, or go to zero in terms of critical failure of machinery if we have the right sensors in place uh, reporting what's going on in real time. 
Uh, and finally, you get a 360 view of all the barn environmental conditions uh, that can impact production, and, and, and that will enable better choices in, in many aspects from, from the way the animals are inseminated to the way the animals are fed. Uh, so, so to wrap it up, uh, at Weebly, we provide a, a no-coding IoT uh, solution platform that can connect to basically all available data sources. We connect to more than 700 sensors and actuators from multiple brands. Um, and we enable this, this type of specific solutions that can be deployed in, in weeks, right? Uh, with no coding and no technical skill required. So, Thank you very much, and I'll be seeing you uh, in the next uh, in the next slides. And again, questions, please add them to the to the Q and A. Now we have our friend Jose Jose Fernandez from Spain to to present us with Aeon chips. Okay, so hi everybody. So I am Jose Fernandez, the CEO of Aeon Chip. To present the, the company, uh, we are a tech company based in, in Barcelona, in Spain. We are dedicated uh, mainly to the design and manufacturing of IoT Internet of the Things devices to optimize industrial and agricultural processes. So we are specialized in the LoRa One control devices. We are members of the LoRa Alliance and had devices certified by LoRa Alliance such as WaterSense are specialized in irrigation control. This is an interesting device that I would like to introduce in the next slides. Next, please. So which issue can on chip solve? The use case that we try to, to present today is the irrigation control. How to do a efficient irrigation control. The issue that we try to, to solve is that the farmers, as my partners have explained in, the, in their presentations, dedicate a lot of a uh, large part of resources in some activities like controlling irrigation. So they have uh, to, to travel to activate irrigation valves. Uh, they spend a lot of time reviewing the correct functionality of the system. And in some cases, they have to change the climatic conditions and they have to, to, to change also the, the irrigation according to, to this climatic condition. So all this is lower cost paid by the owner and his money that we want to, to, to uh, be more efficient by the, the, the owner and win this, this money that is a, a scrap that they are, they are throwing. So the solution that we are proposing is uh, Aonchi use Internet of the Things to offer reliable hardware devices, easy to service, cost-effective and standard in with LoRaWAN technology. In this way, farmers can monitor the crops in real time and control irrigation resources. So it means cost savings by being more efficient. Next slide, please. So what, which are the variables that we should uh, measure in the case of the, the how to manage the irrigation? As my partner before, like the tele has explained, one of the, the more interesting variables uh, to, to measure in to control irrigation is the temperature and the, and the soil moisture. So, we have different solutions in, in the case to, to measure the, the irrigation, the, the soil, sorry. There are solutions with, uh, with different uh, levels of how to measure the, 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 the soil in, with different depths. There are multi-level or point measurement. There are various method, measurements methods. And it's interesting also the, the way of how to calibrate the sensor according to the, to the, to the features and according to the soil. The other variables could be the soil water tension and also the, the ground temperature. Next slide, please. The other interesting things that we should uh, measure, uh, like a variable, is uh, the, the weather station. The weather station is an instrument that uh, gives us the, the air temperature, the air humidity, the barometric pressure, the soil radiation, the rain volume, and also in some, in some cases could offer the possibility of frost warning depending on the, of the climate is interesting. Uh, the temperature, the wind speed, and also the direction of the, of the wind. These are all variables that we should uh, identify to control efficiently the, the irrigation in the field. Next slide, please. The other interesting variable to, to measure is the, the water flow consumption. We have cases that uh, we explain you later, like, or with our partner of Comcesa, 
uh, what is interesting to, to measure the, the, the consumption of the, of the water. There are, in some cases, uh, flow meters with a high volume, like a kind of uh, flow meter called Wallman, that it could have more than 300 uh, cubic meters per hour. And in some other cases, we have to measure low consumption with a other kind of LoRa one flow meter of one inches and with a low flow, like four um, um, cubic meters per hour. Next slide, please. So the idea is to use all these uh, variables uh, that we have identified to control the uh, to control the irrigation uh, efficiently. And the device that we're proposing is the water sense. The water sense description is a water sense a smart water control able to manage till four irrigation outputs with an independent irrigation calendar per output. We can use large valves, valves uh, that can be supplied to, uh, to, to 25 uh, volts AC, 205 volts AC, till uh, 480 volts AC with a um, wide range of possibilities. Also, we are controlling uh, um, pumping motors uh, with, the, with this device. The other interesting connectivity that we use uh, is the MVC port. The MVC port is, uh, is used to commissioning the device uh, through the through a phone and reduce time for installation and maintenance. The other interesting thing is the, is the battery life of the device that we are warranting more than 10 years in a device that can manage uh, actively the, the outputs of the, of the valves. So we are looking for a cost reduction, avoiding wiring because the installation is near to the valve and it doesn't need external supply and free of maintenance during 10 years and reduction in water consumption. Next slide, please. So this is a, an example of a, of a dashboard that we have integrated in, a, in, a, in the field. And the water sales is offered with three different working modes normally. The manual output that offers a control on off of each valve, the irrigation according to a, to a calendar, to a parameter calendar for each valve, and the last uh, working mode is uh, the more efficient is a control irrigation according to a trigger that we normally we program according to the to the value of the of a soil sensor uh, that we assign to to each output. So if the trigger uh, right doesn't is not arriving to, to to this value, then the the activation is is working. And in the case that the trigger has a right to to this value of the most soil sensor, the activation is inhibited. Next slide, please. So these are examples of, of how to we're using uh, water sense. For example, in the number one, we have uh, connected to to large valves uh, with a low pressure in, in drip irrigation near to the directly in the in the valve box. Here we have two two large valves with a device. In the in the other slide, we have a uh, irrigation uh, controlling uh, 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 in the field of, of the olive trees in in Seville in, in Spain. Next slide, please. This is another example that we are using. We are controlling solar pumping with our device. So this is uh, typically with the areas without electricity. We are using uh, water sense to activate the solar pumping according to the value also of, the, of a solar sensor. Next slide, please. These are some examples of water sense that we are using in, in, in Mexico with our partner uh, EFAOT in, in greenhouses. Next slide, please. And this is the, the final use case that my partner uh, Patrick from, from Concesa in Ecuador is going to present. It's a, a very interesting use case that we have the, been deploying in, the, in managing the irrigation in Barano. Next slide, please. And finally, uh, if you want to, to contact to, to anything regarding to our devices, uh, here you are my, my data, and um, please, uh, We'll, we'll find and the, and the one uh, questions. Thanks, and um, I present to, to Patrick. Thank you, Jose. Uh, hi, Patrick, uh, it, the floor is yours. Uh, yes, uh, well, good morning. Uh, basically, what I would like to present is an application which we have developed here in Ecuador for uh, banana plantations. Uh, next slide, please. So basically, in Ecuador is a, the largest producer of bananas in the world. Uh, the country has 33% of world market share. They export 357 million boxes annually. 
there is a plantation size, there's 200,000 hectares of plantations and uh, 8,581 units. Uh, to see larger plantations, we have 800 units of 100 hectares or more. So this is really a large industry here in Ecuador and uh, uh, needs, still needs a lot of technific technification. The next slide, please. So what we made, the analysis we made was the following. We see that you need about a valve every 10 hectares. <clears throat> so calculating with, a, with the size of the, of the plantations and so on, we estimate that there's about 20,000 valves installed in the country. So the potential market we, we feel is about 10,000 valves which need to be automate, uh, automated. Okay, next one. So the first thing we did, because this, is, this, is, this technology is new to the market. So what we really did is uh, introduce uh, the, the gateway to the farms at our cost. Uh, we installed it, we made the uh, test, uh, we test the, the coverage of the, of the farm uh, to uh, be able to convince the, the owners that this is a technology which can be applied for many types of uh, uh, applications. Uh, could we see the next slide? So this is, for example, uh, the application on a 350 hectare uh, uh, plantation, banana plantation, where we, we basically uh, analyzed uh, many spots to see what the coverage was and found out that most, most of the farm uh, was covered. Uh, you, you will see on the top right part of the farm, that's where the gateway was. And uh, analyzing this, we decided that probably the gateway had to be moved to the center of the farm. Can we see the next, uh, the next slide, please? So here you see uh, clearly what the areas are which were covered and the areas at which were not covered, which were basically geographical, uh, 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 let's say, inequality of the uh, land. So basically, uh, we see that with one, one gateway, we covered just about the whole uh, area. And on top of it, we covered the area uh, with sensors, which were uh, at ground level or up to one meter 50 height, and also within the buildings. So that, that really opens up the, the, the possibility of many applications. The next, the next one, please. So the irrigation systems, uh, we can perhaps go to the next one. Normally the farms have the following thing. These are big farms, so uh, either they are activating their valves manually, which is the most cases in Ecuador. They have people uh, running around opening and closing valves. And the people that have, automat uh, have automatization, what they do is they have these small valves near the, the well, well site, and a uh, hose with water pressure going to the valves in the, in the field. So they have to have a whole installation, which is complicated, it's expensive, and is very, uh, very prone to, to, uh, to damage. So that's, that's basically what you find in automated farms. Now let's go and see the LoRa one, which will be the next this is, this is the application we, we designed so that we can control the, the, we, the big valves in the field, which, are, which can be about uh, five, six inches diameter. And uh, we control it with a small valve, which is a, a control valve. And we use the water sense to receive the signal uh, to this valve. Now the next one, please. So how does this work? That would be the next slide. 
So basically, we have the irrigation schedule, which is uh, which is uh, uh, the the graph you see on the left side, and on the right side you see how the valve works. On, on the on the high part, on the top part, you see the 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 control valve, which is uh, activated with a water sense. And in this case, it's a normally closed valve, so there's no water going through. And in the next slide, we see now that we've we've opened the uh, we've opened the valve, and the water goes through. And you see on the left side that it was activated by the software, which comprises all the equipment that you can have in the whole irrigation system, from the well to the to the to the water. Uh, uh, valves. Now the next one, please. So what is the equipment we've been using? We, we are combining everything into the irrigation system. The water, the, the, on the right side, we have the weather station, which is a pestle weather station, which works also with LoRa one. Uh, then we have on the left side, you see on top, you see the water sense. Uh, below that, you have an equipment which is uh, from Zenzeo. This equipment is uh, uh, a communicator for the uh, humidity sensor which you have in the ground, which is on the on the in the middle on the lower side. You see that the box which you see on the left side, the uh, the lower part of the mast, is where the control valve is. We, we put this into a box, which was perhaps not necessary due to the fact that uh, people might want to, to damage it or, 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 or it might disappear for some reason or another. So now you see that from all these, from all these on, the, on the center side, you see the two, two uh, uh, hoses going into the main valve, which are, that's the way we control the main valve through the uh, through the control valve and the water sense as communicator. So basically, this this is the setup we've integrated: the weather station, the humidity sensor, and the the the, the irrigation system. The next one, please. This is the, the we you see the banana plantation on the on the bottom. You see it's a very large plantation. Here we took the the the, the photo from the mast, and you have the the gateway there, uh, which is a Swiss made uh, gateway. So basically, all this this whole setup uh, gives us various advantages. Uh, we have a lower investment cost. We have uh, security that the, 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 it's really done, the work is done, and we have very good profitability. Can we see the next slide? Okay, so here we took an, an, and made an example of a 100 hectare plantation, which we have about 10 valves, we, which we have to ir irrigate, and two to three persons working, opening and closing the valves, Depending on the on the on the time of the year, where it's sometimes more wetter and sometimes drier, so the hydraulic valve cost, which would have to be invested for this manual operation, would be about five hundred dollars. <throat> and what we calculated is with the labor. This is this is of course the uh, these are not all the detailed data. They're, they're very uh, summarized. The savings are about $22,000. The investment we have in the first year is $15,200, which includes all these valves. And the payback we've calculated is eight months. So this is really a, a basically a no-brainer because the people, uh, the project is paid by the, by, the, by the savings in the first year. So all these, all these uh, advantages are leading to the fact that we've made pr proofs of concept and are now uh, negotiating already the, the installation in various, in various farms and groups. Uh, 
We're working now with Dole. We're working with a big group here in La Favorita in, uh, in uh, Bananas and other smaller farms. Thank you. So this is Thank basically you. what we're what we're up to here in Ecuador. Mm -hmm. Thank okay. you, Patrick. Thank you, Patrick, for your for your time and your detailed presentation about uh, how to manage water irrigation in, in banana plantations. So okay. now it's the, the 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 time for Q and A. So I would ask for the different speakers to to be available to to answer questions. Um, I believe most of the questions that were asked on the on the Q and A side are already answered uh, in the system. So if you are curious about your question or somebody else's question, you can you can just tab, click on the Q and A tab and, and see the the questions and the answers. Uh, we have a couple of questions that that we also we captured during this conversation and we wanted to to throw here to to have a, an open discussion. So. I don't know. Um, I'm gonna, for 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 the purpose of being efficient on time, I'm gonna basically uh, address some of these to our to our panelists. So the first one would be, why should we use Laura One in agriculture? And that goes for for our friend Kirk at Semtech. Uh, well, specifically, it really gets into it gets into cost. So when you when you start talking about uh, all the verticals that are available. You're talking oil and gas, medical, industrial, smart cities. All of those verticals generally have um, more available funds um, to invest. Agriculture is generally um, price sensitive and um, the technology of uh, LoRaWAN, um, you know, the, the whole technology around it of, um, you know, the cost, the distance, um, you know, cost of gateway sensors and everything, it's, um, it's really conducive to work with the agricultural marketplace. Th thank you, Kirk. Uh, next question should go to Barney at Tectelic. So what is, the, what is the effect that you're seeing, real effect that you're seeing with actual farmers by implementing these smart agriculture solutions? I don't know if we have Barney. Okay, so so then I'm gonna ask that to Jose, that I'm sure has <laughs> a proper answer for that question. So, sorry, uh, could you repeat the question, yes. uh, Juliana? Yes. Uh, yeah, what, what is what is the real effect for farmers by we using this type of technology implemented in their fields? I think that uh, for the farmers, uh, the use case that, that Patrick has presented is to be more efficient and, and to win this course to do other things. So I think that the, the technology, the Laura one is a great technology for, in our case, for precision agriculture because uh, it's deployment and, and the ability to provide coverage in our geographical area. And I think that we are trying to be more efficient and to, to be and to give these resources for the for the final user. Is Thank that you, Jose. To, to solve? Thank okay. you, Jose. Uh, one, one for for Scott. So, what happens in deployments that have uh, poor connectivity, that maybe have intermittent internet or they're connected via cellular that is not a strong connection? Sure, that's kind of back to the uh, the second network setup I uh, mentioned, uh, which is if you do find yourself in a, in a very, very remote location where you don't have that internet connectivity, or maybe it's intermittent or broken, which is the case, like I say, that we run into with agro things, and we've had this with some others as well, but that was a really good case. Um, you have two options. If you want to connect, do want to connect into the cloud, then you have to look at something such as a satellite connection and um, yeah, Echo Star, Inmarsat, there's a number of satellite companies that have worked with members of the Alliance for that type of backhaul. Uh, some folks I know look at point to point wireless uh, communications uh, specifically set up for their backhaul. Generally speaking, if you don't have the internet connection, that means you don't have the, the you know, a wireless network, an operator. So you can't rely on that. So you have that. Or the other option is, like I mentioned, our, our edge server, or you do have some uh, lighter weight uh, on gateway solutions, and you basically run a localized LoRaWAN network. So you keep everything 
within that area. Uh, so you have your application to analyze your data, you have the server, your gateways, devices, everything is localized on that particular farm or region. And then uh, you're, you're, you, you can handle that and run a very nice LoRaWAN network. So. Thank you, Scott. Uh, and like, I have two more questions. Uh, one is why use uh, standardized type solutions? And this, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump on that one as to Weavy. Uh, Scott mentioned we we within our capability as a platform, we can also uh, deploy a, a, a standalone LoRa LoRa network uh, with a full functionality from getting information from sensors and also um, controlling actuators and, and concrete actions that happen in, in the field. Uh, from our standpoint, the, the, the ideal scenario is uh, to have uh, deployed standard solutions that can be customized for specific customers. So we share today a solution around uh, pre-weaning for pigs, but we also can have solutions for poultry, solutions for irrigations, and solutions for industry 4.0 uh, that not only take advantage of, of LoRa one technology, but also include information coming from PLCs, ERPs, and other sources of data. So you get a whole view of what's going on and can customize a, a very, very uh, unique solution that, that fits the customer's needs. Uh, and finally, there one more question for, for Patrick. I know, Patrick, if you're available, uh, if you can share with us what is the, the main issue that, 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 that your customers are facing when, when buying these irrigation solutions and how you're able to come around and, and offer them the solution even with, that, with those pain points. Patrick, you're in mute. Okay. Basically, what we found as a bit of the resistance is uh, due to the, uh, uh, the fact that the people don't know about the technology. This is really new in, in Latin America. Uh, in the case of Ecuador, where we're just about the only ones that are really promoting it. And uh, that, that causes a bit of resistance or it, it takes more time, I would say. More than resistance, it will just take more time. The other thing is they are uh, used to, to their, their actual way of doing things. And what has happened is, for example, for the humidity sensors, they had, very, they had bad experiences with the supplier. So you know that uh, bad, bad things usually circulate like bushfire and people start believing in them. So we were, we're trying to convince them that if you're going to put water on the earth, the measure the water you have in the earth so you can regulate. That's usually the process you should have. But that's basically, a, it's a question of more information, more education, uh, making more manuals available and so on. Perfect. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, so, so to wrap up, uh, you have uh, our our contact information. We are happy to to answer more questions. Lately, most of the questions were already answered in the in the Q and A uh, box. Um, we would like to thank everybody for your time. Uh, the solutions that we all presented today are available for the different countries in Latin America and, and can spam from uh, multiple verticals, multiple specific solutions. Uh, there's a lot of different sensors, actuators, and, and network infrastructure that you can take advantage of. So thanks a lot to everybody for, for participating in, in, the, in the call today. Uh, we hope this has been informative for you and we hope to do business with you in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.